When you refactor mercilessly, interesting things happen. Uh, Eric Evans calls it a breakthrough. Every little refactoring that you do makes progress in the design, and it's usually very small progress. But if you do this long enough, suddenly new ideas will come, uh, become visible, and you get a breakthrough where you've got an idea for a dramatic way to improve the design, and you slow down and you actually do those refactorings and, and, um, and apply that new idea. This can happen at a really small scale or it can happen at a large scale. So let's look at an example of that small scale uh, breakthrough. This is that same TDD exercise. Uh, the code actually is done at this point, but it's not very good quality. And so at this point, what you're gonna see is uh, a lot of refactoring to factor out the common parsing method. Again, there's gonna be some flashing here. If you're photosensitive, you might wanna look away for a moment. I'll let you know when it's done. This kind of breakthrough uh, at the small scale in this, inside of a single module, this happens every hour or two. Uh, there's also larger scale breakthroughs across multiple classes or modules. And you see that here, uh, this is the first breakthrough in my content management engine. It happened in the first couple of days. Uh, and what's happening is I'm implementing the support for Jade and realizing that I need to have a better way of handling uh, static files and Jade files without spaghetti code. And so it's extracting out into new modules. This typically happens uh, multiple times per week. And you also get larger breakthroughs that are more substantial about the larger application architecture. In my experience, those happen uh, on the time scale of a few times a year. So that's continuous design. It is the second pillar of evolutionary design. And you see it throughout the development of my content management engine, not only are we making the design as simple as we can for the features we have right now? We're also constantly reviewing and improving the design as we go, making changes to support new code, making changes to code we've just added to make it easier to understand, and using practices like test-driven development, collective ownership, pairing or mobbing, and continuous integration. These all are optional, but they help support the discipline required to do continuous uh, design. This is a high discipline process. And by discipline, I mean self-discipline, not imposed discipline. So you need a team where people have made a commitment to working in this way. And again, uh, practices like pairing and collective ownership help with that because nobody's on all the time. So let's get back to our story. Uh, I'm going to just decrease the scale of the, uh, the diagram here so we can look at uh, the classes as it, goes, as it gets bigger. What you're going to see here uh, is only the cross-class breakthroughs at this point. The individual class breakthroughs aren't going to show up. So it's November 11th, 2012. I have a simple but production grade content management engine and web server. Now I have to build my actual website. So that's what I do. Notice how I continue to make improvements to my content management engine, even though my focus is on building out my website. And I'm not showing you all the endpoints. They're sort of in that www package. Um, but these changes that you're seeing to the content management engine, that's continuous design. As I added endpoints, sometimes I realized, oh, the way I thought uh, what I had originally created wasn't quite clean enough or doesn't quite make this convenient enough, so I refactored the, the uh, server to make it better. But uh, something more important happened. Did, it, did anybody see it? It's a mistake. Let me zoom in. Right there. Right there in the bottom left. Now. Uh, I needed a way to make a list of production episodes available to all my web pages. And so, I made a global. I, I, I don't know what I was thinking. The site context was right there. That was available to all web pages. It had the context of the application. I should have put it in there. My, my, the only thing I can think I was thinking was that this is immutable. It was basically a fancy content, constant. It wasn't global state. So I think I was thinking, oh, it's not so bad. It was. Not so good. 
that decision uh, would come back to haunt me. My point here is that simple design is not sloppy design. Do the simplest thing that could possibly work does not mean do the easiest thing that could possibly work. For any design decision, ask yourself, when I need to change this change, make this change, uh, change this decision, when I need to change this decision, not if I need to change this decision, but when I need to change this decision, how hard is it going to be? Practically speaking, I've got seven rules, and I've stolen all of these. None of these are my own. Uh, the first is that every concept should be represented in your application once. If it's important to your problem domain or your solution domain, it should have a named place where you put all the code that's related to that concept. And only once. There should be a place for every important concept for the code to go, and the code should only go in that place. Kent Beck called this once and only once. You may have heard this described as don't repeat yourself or the dry principle, but I really like Beck's approach because it emphasizes the importance of making a place for things. One of the most common errors in design that I see in software is called primitive uh, excuse me. It's called primitive obsession. This is where you have an important idea and you only represent it in a float or a string or something like that. Uh, I know of a company that did e-commerce and they decided to put all, store all their currency in floats or doubles actually. Don't do that, it's bad. It leads into all kinds of problems with taxes and refunds down the road. But because they had primitive obsession when they wanted to fix this, they had to go and find all the places where a double was used to represent money and, and change it. It's really expensive. So use once and only once. Every important concept needs to be represented with a module or a class. Make sure your design intent is clear and obvious. Pair programming helps a lot with this because when you're programming, the things that are obvious to you are usually not obvious to the people around you. So if you use pairing or mobbing, you'll get some instant feedback on your lovely names. Make your code concrete, not speculative. Solve the problems that you have right now. Don't say, I'm going to put in this design to solve this future problem that's going to happen. Solve the problem you have right now. And your code should be cohesive. If two pieces of code change at the same time because they're related, they should be physically close together in your software. They should be preferably in the same file. And if you can't see a piece of code, then it shouldn't be affected by the work you're doing right now. If you make a change, any code you can't see shouldn't break. And then finally, uh, make sure that anything that's used in a lot of places has some sort of abstraction that you can use to change the implementation of that thing without changing the way it's used. Uh, for example, those doubles, primitive obsession. If they had put a currency class or something like that, they could have changed the implementation of their currency without having to go change all their application. This is particularly true if you have third-party libraries. Third-party libraries change out from under you. You want to isolate those changes from the rest of your code. And it's this last rule that my global variable violated. Even though it wasn't global state, so I thought it was fine, it was not isolated. So when I wanted to change the way my configuration worked, I had all this code that was depending on a global or a set of globals. It was quick, it was easy, it was wrong. When, not if, I need to change this decision, how hard will it be? Spoiler warning, too hard. So to summarize, simple design is not sloppy design. Now, despite my mistake with the globals, uh, I continued to modify and improve my site for the next several years. Mostly I was focused on just producing my screencast, but there were new features that came along which led to code changes, which led to design changes, which led to new breakthroughs. Uh, as I run these animations, I want you to note how I'm not just adding new design, but I'm also going back and uh, making improvements to existing design. So after releasing the website, I built support for subscriptions. This was important. It allowed me to collect money and stay in business. I opened up to the public and started taking uh, money in 2013, February 2013. 
In 2014, I spent three days and uh, added a blog to help with content marketing. Uh, I could have used an off-the-shelf blogging tool like WordPress, but uh, I wanted something that was integrated with my site. And besides, it only took three days, and it's been zero maintenance ever since. I find that when people make buy versus build decisions, they often underestimate the cost of maintaining the software that they buy, and I'm including open source in that. Uh, they think, oh, I'm getting used to somebody else's code. They'll maintain it for me. My costs are nothing. Who here has upgraded Rails? <laughs> OK, I rest my case. These third-party tools operate on their schedule. They make changes you don't care about, but you still have to respond to it. And it's never at a convenient time. Maintaining uh, software you buy is not free. So for me, and this is just a personal rule of thumb, you'll have to have your own. If something's going to take me less than a week to build myself, I'm going to seriously consider building it myself, because the stuff I build will be changed on my schedule, not anybody else's. If it's going to take me less than a day to build, and by me, I mean me or the team I'm working with, uh, then we'll generally buy it, or we'll generally build it ourselves, because that's just so little time that the cost of keeping up with changes will typically override the cost of building it ourselves. Speaking of inconvenient third-party code, in 2016, my authentication service, Persona, and reached end of life. And I had to replace it. Uh, I chose Auth0, but I didn't just add the new Auth0 code. I needed to look at the existing design and see how to improve it. This is continuous design. Before making a change, you modify the existing design to make that change easier to make. Question is, how do you do that? Well, I did it using reflective design. Whenever you're working, and this is the third pillar of evolutionary design, whenever you're working in a large system, there is an infinite number of things to improve. There's always mistakes. No design is perfect. There's so much you could make better. The question is, which changes should you make? Where do you want to focus your efforts? That's where reflective design comes in. Traditional design is speculative. Uh, you imagine the features that you're going to build, and they may be written down in a requirements document, or you might just get them incrementally. Uh, you imagine a design that's going to cleanly support those features and any other feature you think might come in in the future. And then you build the piece that you care about right now, leaving hooks for the future design changes that you're expecting. This is the difference between incremental design and evolutionary design, by the way. Incremental design still uses this traditional approach. It just does it in small pieces. Evolutionary design doesn't look ahead in this way. Reflective design doesn't speculate. What you do is you look at the code that you're about to work on. If it's not related to your current task, you don't worry about it. It can wait for later. Because remember, the cost of change decreases over time. So any change we can delay is going to be cheaper to work on later. So we only work on the code that we've got in front of us right now. Then we identify the flaws. What's annoying you? What's, where are the code smells? What's just not nice about this code? Uh, if necessary, you might need to reverse engineer the design of the code. Uh, if it's complicated, you'll draw a class diagram or maybe talk it over at a whiteboard with the rest of your team. But, uh, but often, if you've been using simple design, the design will be obvious. So you won't need to do a whole lot of work here. Then you imagine how you can improve the design of the code. Um, for bigger change changes, you're going to talk it through with your teammates. But you're not going to do a big plan. What you're going to do is say, what's the first thing that we can work on? And you're going to refactor your code to incrementally reach that new design idea in small steps. As you work, you'll often, well, sometimes, discover flaws in what you came up with, because when you hit the real world, your design ideas are never as clean as you're hoping they're going to be, in which case you go back and you think, what's going on? And you go through this process again. This is a skill, just like traditional design. It's something that needs to be practiced. And I'm going to use my Auth0 transition as an example. Uh, this is what the design looked like at the start of that transition. Uh, but I didn't have this diagram. I made it for this, for this conference. So, there was nothing like this. I just had the code. So the first thing you do is you start out by reviewing the code. And in my case, that meant looking at the login and logout endpoints. Uh, 
I hadn't touched this code in over two years. So the last substantial change was in 2014. So it was kind of like I'd never seen it before. Uh, so I had to study the code. Uh, the logout was simple. It just cleared a cookie. All the real work was happening in login. Uh, login led me to two classes, subscriber account and persona client. Uh, persona client led me to HTTPS REST client. And subscriber account uh, led me to Recurly client, which in turn led to HTTPS REST client. So this was the universe of code I had to work with. Not the whole design, just this part of the design. And this is how it typically works. Next, I needed to identify the flaws. And oh, there were a ton. <laughs> there were so many flaws. I, um, I had a global log module. I had this magic email string that I used for a special case when login failed, but I still wanted to pe let people in. There was this weird relationship between subscriber account and recurly client and the login endpoint. But all of that was overridden by a huge glaring failure. Uh, there were no tests, except for the recurly parsing logic. And so that was obviously the first thing to work on. You don't fix everything when you're doing reflective design. You just fix the first thing, the most important thing. The third step was to re reverse engineer the design. But uh, despite the flaws in the code, this was really easy to understand. There was no method longer than 20 lines of code. They were typically longer than 10 lines. They were, the names were clear. I didn't have to read all the code. And the longest, largest file was 167 lines. This is not because this was a small project. This is because I was doing good design. Uh, next, I needed to imagine uh, how to improve it. It was obvious it needed tests. I could do more, and I eventually did. But reflective design is an incremental and iterative process. You pick your first problem, and you solve that. And then your second problem, and solve that. And your third problem, and solve that, until the code's good enough for you to add the feature that you want to add. Don't solve everything. You'd never have time to solve everything. So focus where your, your efforts where it's going to do the most good. It's OK to stop, because you will catch it the next time. So this needed tests. Uh, when, I, when I first wrote this code, uh, I didn't know how to test infrastructure. Uh, I was under a lot of time pressure. So what had happened was I just tested it manually. And then I sort of set it aside and didn't touch it anymore. And that worked great for four years until another day. Uh, but another day had come. And now I knew how to test infrastructure. I had to figure it out for my screencast. This is an example of how delaying decisions can actually reduce your costs. Uh, it would have been really expensive for me to figure out how to do this infrastructure testing at that time when I was learning Node for the first time. But now it was easy. So my plan was to test my REST client uh, against a fake server, then implement my nullable infrastructure pattern, and use that as a basis for further improvements. And that's exactly what I did, incrementally, one refactoring at a time. That, once those tests were in place, I could make more substantial changes. And that's what you see here. Each of these changes, each time you see some, an animation here, uh, that is using reflective design. I review the code, identify the flaws, reverse engineer the design, imagine improvements, incrementally refactor. There was no grand plan here. It was just, what's my goal, and what's the next thing that's in the way of my goal? And then once the auth0 client was added, which happened fairly early, as I look at this design, how is it not good enough? How is it not following the principles of simple design and make those improvements? I ended the screencast in 2018 after a six-year run. Uh, but the server code was a real pleasure to work with at this point, so I wanted to continue to keep it. And I also had some other projects coming up that could use sophisticated websites. I didn't have an urgent need uh, for, those, uh, for those websites, so I just, but I thought it, they're going to come along. So I decided to take this code and generalize it to support multiple websites. Uh, the problem was, uh, and because I didn't have a pressing need, I did a sort of a fun side project. But of course, the entire code base had been written and built under the assumption that there was only ever going to be one website, and that it was going to be my screencast website. But luckily, with evolutionary design, and I've seen this over and over again on many projects, evolutionary design means never having to say you're sorry. Everything is possible with evolutionary design, as long as you keep the design clean, as long as you follow the rules of simple design, which I mostly had except for those globals. 
I, in fact, I had kind of doubled down on the global mistake, and I kept tossing more and more stuff into the globals, because that's how we do things, isn't it? So it was time to fix them. I also needed to separate the site-specific code from the generic content management engine. And that's what I did in my spare time here and there. There goes the globals. Wait, wait, that. All right, there. That cleared them mostly out. The only ones that were remaining were a couple related to the log that I still haven't quite fixed yet. This illustrates a key idea of evolutionary design, patience. There have been so many cases where I didn't know the best design. In fact, I almost never know the best design when I first work on something. But I take my best shot and then let it go. If it's crufty and it works, it still works. I know that I'm going to get to it next time. And that's always been true, both for me and the teams that I've worked with who'd use evolutionary design. Our first design is never perfect, but in five years, it's amazing. Just follow the campsite rule. You don't need to make your code perfect, just make it better every time you touch it. And if you do this, be prepared to be surprised. If you let go of your preconceptions, uh, some of your breakthroughs are going to lead in truly interesting directions. Uh, this doesn't happen often, but it's been true for me on every long-lived project that I've worked on that's used evolutionary design. Uh, in this case, in my effort to get rid of the globals, I discovered the idea of making, uh, having purely functional web serving. Uh, typically, in Node, you serve a file by calling send or something like that. I don't even remember. It's abstracted out. Uh, but instead, what I do, my, what my code does is it returns a data structure. And that leads to some really interesting capabilities, particularly in the realm of timeouts and air handling. Um, that led me to polyglot page templates. A page can be written in Markdown and be embedded in a template using Jade, which is embedded in a master page using HTML. And that brings us to where we are today. Uh, it's a long way from where I started. Uh, it was done step by step keeping the code clean, deploying continuously, always staying releasable. To sum up, to sum up, evolutionary design is about reducing the cost of change, and I think this is critical. You need to see this curve. I don't care how you do it, but you need to see this curve if you're doing modern software development, if you're doing agile development where you take requirements late. Evolutionary design has three pillars. Simple design, only design for what we need right now and keep it clean. Continuous design, constantly review and improve the design. And reflective design, make your design decisions based on the code you actually have, not what you think might be useful in the future. And if you do this, you'll end up with an amazing design. It won't be perfect in the beginning, but it will be a real pleasure to work with in the future. So I want to close by showing you what seven years of evolutionary design looks like. I'm James Shore. This has been Evolutionary Design Animated. Thank you.